just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive everything. Say just one touch. Just one touch. I feel the power. Feel the power of it. Hey, just one touch. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. There's nothing, There's nothing that our God can do. And there's another There's prison wall that can break We'll praise the name, oh, praise the name that, makes that makes a way. way. There's nothing that our God can do. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. somebody there by you and tell them that is the truth. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. We welcome all of our guests that are here tonight. Amber, good to see you here tonight. God bless you. Got to talk to your dad just a little while ago. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Amen. Y'all have that picture ready? Okay. Most of you probably have heard by now that uh, was Stratton Sister Jazzy's home burn. I'm going to show you a picture here. And that is their home. And they were in bed asleep when this was all starting. I got a call from him, and uh, I had gone to bed early, had a big day scheduled the next day. And uh, he said, Pastor, you got a little something going in our attic. I can smell it. And... Uh, I think it's on fire up there. I said, well, are you getting stuff out of your house? He said, well, it's just in the attic. I said, okay. Call me if you need me. About 20 minutes later, I just, I called him back. I said, 
as the fire department showed up. Yeah, they're here right now. They're here. The next morning, I wake up to pictures like that, and I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. But uh, we want to bless them. There's two ways you can do it. There's a uh, GoFundMe page available, or you can give to the church and just mark it, uh, Stratton, Jazzy, whatever, and Sister Denise will make sure that they get a check for that. My wife looked at pictures. She said, that's awful. That's terrible. I said, no, it's not. I said, we ought to be running the aisles and praising the Lord that they are here, not hurt, nothing wrong. I think we ought to stand up and give the Lord some praise for that. telling you, God's been good to us. It was just a week or so ago that uh, the Ashley had the deal fall off the roof, weighed about 100 pounds, hit her in the head, temporarily knocked her out. No concussion, no stitches, no nothing. God is good. Amen. And then here we are this week, and a fire, they lost everything there, but thank God none of them were hurt. And uh, I know there's a lot of concern for that little baby, but the Lord is good. Amen. Thank God. And thank God for the privilege of being a part of a great, loving, caring church. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Our ushers are coming. Worship the Lord as you give tonight.
of the Lord walk into the room the difference it makes but as much of a difference as he makes when he walks into that room whether it's your home your church there is nothing like him walking into this room right here you talk about a change amen I feel the presence of the Lord here wanting to minister to folks. You would stand together with me. We're going to look to him in prayer. Ernest, good to see you here tonight. He's asking prayer for Jonathan Haynes. He's your adopted son, is that correct? And uh, he has stomach cancer and uh, needs a miracle. I want to pray for Jonathan. Also, Scooter Davis is traveling to Florida and the weather is getting bad. They've asked for prayer for him. And... Uh, we remember the Carpenter family, Sister Loreen Carpenter passed away. We see Brother Johnny here tonight. That's his sister. And uh, to know her was to love her. Very sweet, kind lady. And uh, we will miss her. Let's pray that God would be near to that family. Her husband, James, is very broken right now, as you can only imagine. Let's pray God would minister to them. Pray together with me right now. Lord Jesus. Thank you for your beautiful presence we feel in this place tonight, God. There is nothing to compare to the touch of your spirit, Lord. I'm asking you right now to minister to every need, God. I ask you, Lord, to minister to Jonathan God Haynes. He needs a miracle in his body. We're believing for deliverance from that cancer by the power and the authority of Jesus' name. We believe you to be with Scooter as he travels, Lord. Protect him, we pray. We ask you to be especially near to the Carpenter family this evening. Comfort them. Strengthen them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Scott. It's Wednesday night, man. Good to see you here. Praise God. Ryan, good to see you here tonight. Praise God. And it is so good to have our dear friend, Brother Mitchell, here to minister to us tonight. And uh, I just want you to know, you may not fully understand it now, but somewhere down the road, there will be an understanding in the mind of every member of this church. This is our dear friend. Trust me, this is our dear friend. Already been such a blessing to us. He's here to lead our campaign to uh, hopefully build new facilities for the church and the school. But embarking on that campaign, he told me, he said, Pastor, if you'll just trust me, it's going to be much more than that. But you're going to find people praying more. You're going to find people being more faithful. And uh, I didn't really grasp that at the beginning. But uh, as we are walking through steps preparing for that, it is becoming more clear all the time. 
that God is getting ready to do some amazing things in this church. I am so thankful that my son, Ryan, called me up one day and he said, Dad, I hear y'all talking about moving or buying land or doing something. He said, you need to get Brother Marvin Mitchell down there. I said, well, son, when we get some property or something, we'll, we'll talk to him. He said, before you do anything, you need to get Brother Mitchell down here. And so we did that, and uh, he came down, and uh, I don't know if he's ever been drilled like that, but I kept track of the time. It was seven hours that day, brother. And I asked him question after question after question. I cannot tell you how comforting it was to me as a pastor to feel like God had sent somebody to help us realize the vision, the dreams that God has given us. Would you make Brother Mitchell welcome as he comes tonight? Wow, I feel the love. And I uh, would love to think that that is unique to me, but uh, as we have gotten to know each other quite well, the one thing that is common around here is feeling loved. And I appreciate your pastor, I appreciate this incredible ministry team that loves people the way Jesus intended us to love people. If you have felt and been a beneficiary of the love of this church and this leadership, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Now, I want to ask you something. I want to ask you if you're happy and you know it. <laughs> say amen. amen. All right. Well, I'm amongst friends already then. It is such an honor to be here, a true privilege. I mean that sincerely to be back at New Life. The last time I was here, after a seven-hour grilling, a uh, pastor asked me to, um, to preach, and then tonight he has extended the incredible invite to teach to you tonight, something that I had uh, prepared to share with our campaign leadership team and to all of our campaign team members. Would you just raise your hands up if you're in the house tonight? Just lift your hands up. Go ahead, raise them up high. Come on, the rest of the church, can we show them some love and thank them for all the time and effort that they are putting in? And I do want to make this very, very clear that soon and very soon in our preparation to march toward this incredible vision that God has extended to your pastor and your pastor to this church, he will be speaking a little bit more about that on Sunday, um, everybody in this body of believers will have an opportunity to change the future of this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is very exciting to have walked this road with many churches, to have led the church that I pastored for many years through this very similar journey, and to see what is about to happen, and to know, to know what God is about to do in the midst of this great church, and by faith, believe that it will be exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or even think and with great expectation, realize that he is God and God alone, and his ways are above our ways. His ways are so far above my ways, I couldn't understand them. But with expectation, I believe that God is about to do the miraculous in this church. Would you say amen if you believe that? It is such an honor to be here tonight, and so many friends, and going back a long way. And to my friend Ryan, thank you, sir. For being here tonight, I don't think it was because I'm here, but I certainly, I'll take it, you know, I'll just, I, I'm, I don't think that's the case, but I'm going to act like it, so just just let me be, let me feel like I'm that love that you drove all the way over here, but I do know he loves me, and I love him, and I appreciate him very much. I want to talk tonight about a subject that I talk about with leaders quite often, and I do want to say this as an introduction. Uh, I believe that everybody has the ability to lead, everybody. And I know that's a very liberal definition of leadership. And let me unpack that for just a second before we get into our lesson tonight. Um, I believe that everybody is called to lead first themselves, 
Amen? And based on how I steward leading myself, then I believe God can open up opportunities for influence, doors for his favor, for his voice to be shared. And sometimes that's in the form of a family, right? That's a blessing of leadership. Mom and dads, would you say yes? Yeah, right? And then, and then if, if we are stewards over those circles of influence and leadership, then I believe God begins to extend our reach further and further so that we can make kingdom size impact. I say that to us individually because everybody in this house, including this little guy over here, half taking a nap, and maybe somebody on the back who's a little older and a little taller that may be taking a nap and had a long day, and this guy's voice is just putting me to sleep. We all have the ability to lead. And I want to extend this and say that as we as a church steward our leadership, both individually and collectively, Pastor, I believe God is going to open up doors of influence to us in this community. I believe he's going to open up doors of influence to our students in, in schools around this area. And we're going to see this incredible Christian school be a light that shines so bright in the midst of so much confusion and education. I, I cannot wait to see the leaders that come out of the next generation. I can't wait to see the ministries we haven't even thought of that are going to rise up out of the next generation of children as they pray great prayers of faith. I can't wait to see the way God uses you in your influence, in your career, in your uh, network, in your neighborhood. Does anybody hear me tonight? Do you believe that God is about to do things in a way that is greater than ever before? I really believe that. So tonight, I want us to stretch our understanding and perhaps our capacity in how we communicate as leaders. So I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to ask them, what have you been communicating? What have you been communicating? What are we communicating in leadership? I don't know whoever invented the English language, but they were crazy. Because if you're fluent in the English language, you must be a genius. There's so many reasons why the English language is very difficult to learn, and there's even more reasons why it's so difficult to speak. Let me give you a few examples here tonight. This is really, I think, revelatory for us. Help, the, help us, Lord. There is no egg in eggplant, nor ham in hamburger, neither apple nor pine in pineapple. English muffins weren't invented in England, nor French fries in France. Sweet meats are candies, while sweet breads, which aren't sweet, are meat. Quick sand works slowly. Boxing rings are square. And a guinea pig is neither from Guinea, and nor is it a pig. Why is it that writers write, but fingers don't fing, grocers don't gross, and hammers don't ham? If the plural of tooth is teeth, why isn't the plural of booth beef? One goose, two geese, so one moose, two meese. Doesn't it seem crazy that you can make an amends but not one amend? If you have a bunch of odds and ends and you get rid of all, of one of all but one of them, what do you call that? Is it an odd or is it an in? These are good questions tonight, church. If teachers taught, why don't preachers prot? If a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? In what language do people recite at a play and play at a recital, ship by truck and send cargo by ship, have noses that run, and we have feet that smell? How can a slim chance and a fat chance be the same thing? I'm confused already. While a wise man and a wise guy are opposites, you have to marvel at the unique lunacy of a language in which your house can burn up as it burns down, ironically, in which you fill in a form by filling it out and in which an alarm goes off by going on. English was invented by people, not computers, and it truly reflects the creativity of the human race, which, of course, is not a race at all. That is why when the stars are out, they are visible, but when the lights are out, they are invisible. The point of this ridiculous demonstration of our crazy language is to help to convey tonight that you can have all the right words and you can know the exact right thing to say and still not communicate clearly. It takes more than knowing the right words to communicate effectively. What is the heart speaking? Luke chapter 6 and verse 45 reveals to us, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is the heart speaking? What is my heart saying? 
We've got to get to the heart of the matter, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, because what we communicate is vital to leadership, and what we communicate is absolutely imperative to this great vision that God has entrusted to the hands of this church. I always say, don't ever trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. There's a lot of times earlier in my life, not just as a leader, but as a Christian, just as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a leader, I used to try to fix the filter. Has anybody ever tried to reinforce your filter? How's that work? Works great till you're mad. It works great till somebody cuts you off in traffic. It works great till you come home after a really tired, weary day, and the filter is broke. And your wife asks you an innocent question, and for some reason, the mountain of the day just comes right out of your mouth like a bursting volcano. Here's the problem, y'all. We can't fix the filter. We've got to fix the source. Here's the great thing. We don't have to filter what we're communicating when the source of what we are communicating is in God's hands. Out of the mouth, the heart speaketh. We've got to get to the heart of the matter And we don't have to worry about what we're saying and what we're communicating and what our spirit is emanating and what our face is communicating, what our nonverbal communication, our body language is communicating. When we get the heart of the matter right, Pastor, we can allow God to just breathe out of us. We can allow him to speak through our life. I don't have to turn on the filter and worry about what room I'm in, if I've had a good day or a bad day, because I am really judged by what's on the inside when I get hurt the most. When my side is pierced, does the blood of Jesus pour out, or is it infected with bitterness and and anxieties and stresses and fears? What's in the heart of the matter? What's in the heart of the matter? What is at the heart of this vision? Is it great faith? Some might say, well, I don't see how. How are we going to do this, Pastor? I don't quite see how this is possible. I used to think that the opposite of faith was doubt. But when I read 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, it says we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. And I realize that the opposite of faith is not doubt. It is my natural sight. I'm going to pray a prayer over this church right now, and maybe you would lift your hands and join me, that God, you would allow your spirit to wash over our natural eyes. I pray, God, that you wash over our hearts Let us begin to see what you've already seen through your spirit. Give us the faith to expect that you will do what only you can do after we have done all that we can do. God, if we are stewards with your church and with this life and with our voice, God, if we are stewards with our time and our talent and our treasure, if we are stewards with this great church and this great community that we are trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Help us by baptizing our eyes. Wash our eyes. Take away the scales of limitation. Take away the scales of impossibility. Take away the scales of uneasiness. Take away, Lord, the hindrances, what I cannot imagine with my own mind. Give us the mind of Christ. Let me see through your eyes what you have seen for me, for my house, for this church, for this community. Oh, for the uplifting of your name, for the glory unto God. Let a great revival outpouring come through this church and it would be a revival of faith for things we cannot see help us Lord help us Lord to see what you have seen to see what you have seen we as leaders as influencers in our families and in our homes and in this church and in this community we must communicate to the best of our ability during this incredible season of growth of what this church is about to experience in faith. God has granted a clear vision, I have no doubt. I've been with your pastor enough over the past few months. God has lit a fire under him. God has entrusted a vision to him. This is not your pastor's vision. 
This is not your pastor's church. This is God's church. This is a God idea. This is a God idea. Where this church is going, I wish somebody would get a hold of that right now and believe this is a God idea. And God can make a way where nobody else can imagine a way. If this is a God thing, God already has a plan for us to be a part of fulfilling this vision. And in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. And I take great comfort and I count it a great privilege to be a part of his bride where I can join my arm in his and know that, Lord, I'll do everything I can to facilitate the completion, the complete work of your church. And whenever my reach, Lord, is just a bit short, I know your hand is not short. I know your arm can extend extend out from this place. Your provision has no bounds. God, I believe this is a God idea, and this is a God vision for a God-centered church, and he will take care of his church. I believe that. Does anybody believe that today? I believe that today. As a church gets bigger, we have to get smaller And that this can't just be a top-down, pulpit-driven vision. This has got to be something we get a hold of and we put it deep inside of our hearts and say, God, let me put my shoulder to the wheel and begin to speak faith into this community. This vision should flow from God through your pastor and in through this church, but it shouldn't stop there. It should flow out through the voices, through the heartbeats, through the giftings, through the anointings of leaders that God has called for such a time as this. There is a concept that I read about 12 years ago in Harvard Business Review, and it was called vision dripping. Has anybody ever heard the term vision dripping? I know a lot of times on social media you hear, how about anybody who's a lot younger than me? Have you ever heard anything like, we're going to drip this? Has anybody heard that phrase? Anybody? Crickets? I hate it when that happens. Do you guys know what Instagram is? Yeah, okay. Most of the things that are released on Insta, they're dripped. Did you know that? And you might think that that started on social media, but it didn't. It actually started many years before in some business psychology office, and they realized through analysis, through case study after case study, they realized that there are great visionary leaders, vision casters, if you will, people that speak vision over great crowds of people, over organizations and countries and companies and businesses and and even churches. But what they have found is that the difference between vision that is fulfilled oftentimes and vision that is just heard or sounded is a concept called vision dripping. Everybody say vision dripping. Okay, that sounds wet. Vision dripping is a concept that says once vision is cast, for example, once your pastor preaches about the future of this church, are you eager to hear about the future of this church? I can't wait. Once he shares that vision, it's like, it's like a living thing. It's like a baby. It's precious. It's vulnerable. It needs certain things. It needs life. It needs to be fed. It needs to be protected. And, and a pastor is given a great vision, and he casts that vision to a great group of men and women like yourself. And then that vision is in our hands, and then you decide what you want to do with it. Vision dripping is a concept that I think we need to get a hold of, and I want us to just understand this. This is not complicated. Vision dripping is what happens when I have coffee on a Monday after a pastor has preached about the future of the church, and it's the conversation that we sit down and talk about, is that even possible? How are we going to do it? It's the questions we ask at our own dinner tables, and, and we are giving life or we are giving death to the vision in that very moment. It's, it's when you're driving to work on a commute after something, you know, that God has done in a service and you have some doubts about whether or not, was that a real encounter with God? Was that, a, was that just a manifestation? Was that, a, was that just an outpouring of God or did I just eat too much pizza? 
Did I get really excited in the, in the moment, Pastor Stephen? Did I, did I get really worked up because there were a lot of really Holy Ghost people around me and I felt God, but was that real? And it's the questions we ask and then you phone a friend and hopefully it's the right friend. And in that moment, that friend can either fuel your faith or kill your faith. And when this vision comes forth across this pulpit over the next few months of this church, we've got a responsibility. We are stewards of the future of the church. And we can give life to this vision or we can give death to this vision. And the difference between churches that change their world, that impact their communities for eternities, are the ones that people in seats just like yours, when they hear that vision cast, they say, God, I don't have to know how, I just have to know who. Who spoke this into existence? Who put this into my pastor's heart? When he preached and he cast this vision for the future of this great church and the ministries within it, who spoke that? I want to preach to you tonight. His name is is Jesus, and he's the author, and he's the finisher of your faith, and by faith, you get a hold of every conversation after that vision, and you say, I believe we can do it. How are we going to do it? I don't have to know how. I know who. This is God's church. This is God's vision, and we'll do it God's way. And if we could get a hold of our faith, church, God will show us what he has already seen. <laughs> Speak life. Because we're surrounded by a world that's speaking death. Speak encouragement. Because we are surrounded by people that are speaking criticism. Use your voice to change your world. But don't just fix the filter, fix the source. So when you open your mouth, God's voice comes out. God's hope comes out. God's love comes out. Faith in your God pours out of your pores. God help us to be your church now more than ever before We've got to hear from heaven, and heaven will pour out through the vessels on this earth. God, don't go around me. Don't go around us. But God, I pray your spirit would go through us. You didn't fill me with the Holy Ghost just to save my sorry hide. You filled me with the Holy Ghost so that I can be saved, that I can testify of his saving power, and that the Holy Ghost can pour out through me. God, wash my heart and my mind and my voice. Somebody say amen. amen. We have got to give life to this vision. Some of the best sermons I have ever heard that have impacted me the most, Pastor, were not with a microphone. They were sitting down across from somebody. And I looked at their life, and their life was the best sermon I had ever, ever heard. Sitting down to just have coffee or phoning a friend at a time when I'm, I'm vulnerable and maybe my faith is shaking a bit. Anybody ever been there? Who's the person you call to say, hey, this is where I'm at? And just driving down the road, in five minutes, they take you from the edge of an abyss of your faith to you say, I can do this because I'm not alone. And they just spoke truth into my life. We've got to be a church full of those people because there are people starving and hungry and hurting and they don't even know what hope is. And they need to phone a friend, and that friend needs to be you. It's about time we use our voice to speak life to the lifeless and hope to the hopeless. We've got to let our shine, our light shine through what God is putting into our hearts. What is at the heart of this vision? What is at the heart of this vision? We've got to be clear about this vision. One of the greatest enemies of, of vision is confusion. I've said this many times. It's my opinion that the greatest affliction in our country, 
in the last four or five years, the greatest pandemic, if you will. I don't believe that it was COVID-19. I'm not going to give old Rona that much credit. It was a spirit of confusion. It was a spirit of confusion. It got into our homes. It definitely got into our workplace. It's still all over our government, both sides of the aisle. Sorry if I offended anybody. It's just confusion, mass confusion. What I've learned is that the enemy doesn't have to defeat me if he can distract me. And that confusion tried to get into our homes, and it tried to get into our churches. But we're winning because the apostolic church is the fastest growing church on the face of North America. We have come out, I travel all over this country, and I'm telling you, our churches are better positioned to impact our cultures than any other voice in this country. We cannot afford to be distracted because he doesn't have to defeat me if I am distracted. I will defeat myself. We can't allow confusion to come into our spirits. We cannot allow confusion to come into this church. Have got to speak to it, mark it, the Bible says. Speak to it and say, No, 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 not today, devil. Confusion, get out of my heart, get out of this church, get out of my home. We have got to come together for such a time as this. Now, I know I'm speaking and perhaps almost getting a little preachy there, a little treachy. I can't help it. I get very excited about the future of the church. But here's a practical example. Let's say uh, tonight after church, I started a rumor. I know that never happens in your church, but in the church I pastored, we still had to deal with rumors. And let's say I started a rumor. Pastor Melton loves goldfish. I mean, like, he's got a problem. Loves goldfish. Now, here's the thing. Everybody over 40 would get on Facebook because apparently only old people use Facebook. Is that right? Did I hit that one right or no? No? Yeah. He, he agrees with me. Even if it's out of pity, thank you. I appreciate that. So everybody over 40 gets on Facebook, and they're like, man, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And, and Pastor Milton loves goldfish. He loves goldfish. So we're going to buy him a gigantic fish tank. And we're going to fill it full of those happy little fish. So every time pastor comes in his office, he can look at this giant fish tank full of those happy little golden delight little fish. Do we have a picture of a goldfish? Oh, hi, Goldie. And then everybody under 40 gets on Instagram. Is that right? I'm so irrelevant. It's bad. Middle age opened its arms to me several years ago, and I just welcomed me in like a warm blanket, and it hasn't let me go. But everybody under 40 gets on Instagram, not TikTok, because that's of the devil, but finally got a nod and a smile. <laughs> Amen. And it's, you know, on Instagram we post that pastor loves goldfish. So this next year for, for Pastor Appreciation, we're going to go to Costco or Sam's. Do you guys have Costco or you have Sam's here? Yeah, both. Oh, that was, look, that was unity right there. Which one's better, Costco or Sam's? There's division in the church. See how easily we get confused? 30 seconds ago we were together, now we're divided. The enemy won that round. So we go to both, and we buy a pallet full of those tasty little snack crackers that all of you young mothers, I know who you are. I see you when I'm preaching. When I'm up here, you bring them in your diaper bags and you say they're for the kids. But when you're about 25 minutes into a message, I see you get hungry and you have a buffet back there on the second to back row. And you're blaming your kids. You're taking food out of your children's mouth. You know who you are. There's fingers. Look at, the, look at this. Exhibit A. Give him a hand. But everybody under 40 says Pastor Melton needs a lot of crackers. So we're going to buy him a year's supply of goldfish. And then word gets back 
to Sister Melton. And she goes, you guys are nuts. He doesn't want crackers, and he doesn't want a fish tank. There's just a new Chinese restaurant called The Goldfish that he said, hey, baby, we should try that sometime. This is a very trivial example, but how quickly we can go from being clear to being confused, from being together to being divided. We can't afford to let anything in the practical or the spiritual confuse us in this season. We cannot let anything divide us. We have got to be united in this season. When you see something that's confusing, and it may just be vetting some information before you make an assumption. Do you guys ever make assumptions that are wrong? Man, I do it all the time. Make certain that we're on the same page. And it doesn't even have to be your page. We just have to be on the same page. It is so important that we learn to communicate clearly in this season. Are you with me? Clear communication is vital because we can have great intentions, but it can still result in bad execution if we're not careful. Clear communication is the foundation for unity. We need a unified voice. Everybody say a unified voice. Unified tone. Everybody say unified tone. And a unified spirit. And that is creates a clear picture, and people will commit to clear vision, but they will shy away from a confused one. You can't build consensus, raise money, or most importantly become unified, aiming at an ambiguous and always changing target. That is why it is essential that we each well acquaint ourselves with the mission of the church and the vision for this season of the church. We've got to get a hold of this as if it was our own. We've got to, communi- we've got to communicate with a unified spirit because unity is the it factor. Everybody say united. 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 Anybody's shoes ever come untied? It's amazing how you can have such a powerful word like united and you just change just a nuance and it is untied. It's the same components, it's the same number of letters, it takes the same space on the screen, it takes the same amount of time for me to communicate to, to you. But we can go from being united to being untied very, very, very subtly. When my shoes come untied most of the time, it usually doesn't happen, Pastor Rhett, all at once. It's usually a gentle unraveling. It's a slow untightening of it being fastened, everybody say together. Together. And, and, and before I know it, I'm running along, usually through an airport, and I hear these little, I know there's a, there's a really fancy name for these little things at the end here. Does anybody know the name of these? What is it? Genius. Ag, ag- Aglets. And these things be, begin to like clickety-clack against the, the floor. And then that tells you that your shoe is untied. But it's too late. At that point, this middle-aged man has already rolled his ankle and probably stumbled over and knocked over a little old lady. But the, the reason my shoe came untied in the first place is neglect. I neglected to tighten it or to double-fasten it, double-knot it. And very subtly and very slowly, it begins to become unraveled. And once it had a great purpose, but if I don't tend to it, very quickly the thing that that helped me fasten my shoe to my foot and helped me take a path and take my steps toward my future, very quickly that, that, that thing can become a nuance and can even cause me to trip and stumble. We can't afford to trip and stumble. 
We can't afford to be united when we're in this church and then we are untied when we go home. We can't afford to be united in the parts of this phased expansion plan, but be untied when we don't agree what the architectural design may look like. I'll just tell you what, it doesn't matter if the new carpet is purple, it doesn't matter if all the lights are on or the lights are all off, it doesn't matter if we have pews or chairs or theater seats, and now I'm getting in really deep because somebody's theology is messed up right now, so I'm just going to look at the ceiling, and it doesn't matter if we have a blacked out ceiling or we have theatrical lights, here's the, here's the honest truth. I have felt the power of the Holy Ghost when all the lights were on and all the lights were off. I have my preference, but my preference is not more important than the future of his church. My opinion is not more important than the unity of the body of Christ. You know what I think about seats? I think the most apostolic seating model that we should have is no seats. I stand up the whole time anyway. The whole thing's one big altar call, Rhett. Let's just have a big, big area of worship. I mean, the worship team gets up here, and they're begging people to get out of their chairs, right? And, and, then, and then at the end of the service, us preachers are begging you to get out of your seats and come to an altar. Why don't we just get over, over our opinions? I don't think God cares if the purple carpet, I don't care if he cares about the lights, I don't think he cares about what the building looks like. You know what he does care? He cares that his church is together. He cares that our spirits are united. He cares that we are in one mind and one accord. Before the outpouring in the upper room, we forget sometimes that they came together in one mind and they were in one accord. And then the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. He was fully come. We've got to be united. It's the it factor of a successful vision. It is the key to our actions and our words coming together. And I used to say that, oh, actions speak louder than words. My wife used to threaten that she was going to put that on my tombstone because I said it so often. And I was like, now wait, you're presuming that I'm going to die first. Are you going to kill me and then put it on my tombstone? But what I've learned that in leadership, pastor, actions and words both speak very loudly. And my actions and my words have to speak the unity of the body of Christ. We've got to speak confidently about the future of this church. Such subtleties, such nuances can unravel or untie us. Let me give you an example. Somebody says, man, that guy's, he's, uh, he's very excited about the future of this church. And pastor, he's, he's really excited about the church. And he said that that Marvin guy's a friend of his, so I, I guess we can trust him, but what do you think about all this campaign stuff? I heard a bad story once about campaigns. And you'll hear statements like, well, we'll wait and see. Do you know what wait and see means to me? That's doubt. In that moment when somebody asks you, what do you think about the vision for the church? What do you think about pastors sharing about the campaign for the church? What do you think about this expansion plan that God's going to help us reach the next generation of disciples? I'm going to put this into your spirit, and I hope you receive it from the bottom of my heart. We have no time and we have no room for a wait-and-see attitude about the future of the church. I'm not waiting to see. I'm waiting on the Lord, but I'm waiting for him to baptize my sight that I can walk by faith and not by my sight. We cannot wait any longer. There is a world that needs a church that is on fire, that is together, that is united. Don't allow a subtle moment, a small moment, to cripple a great vision for a great church. Give life to the vision. To be united is joined together. To be untied is to long, no longer be fastened to. God help us to be tied to the vision. You avoid becoming untied from the vision, from this purpose of the church, from the future of this church by being united in prayer over this vision. What is the opposite of neglect in the church? It's relationship. We must get this in our hearts. This vision is the greatest undertaking in the history 
of new life. They'll believe it. They'll see it through the Holy Ghost. This vision is the greatest undertaking in the history of this church. I'm going to keep saying that and believing it until you believe it as much as I do. I saw what happened in the church that I pastored. I've seen this happen all over the church, in churches of all shapes and sizes and cultures and demographics. I can't wait for you to witness the miraculous power that happens in a season just like this in your church. Because vision positions us to fulfill the promised future that God has spoken into us. We've got to believe this. We've got to speak this. We've got to act upon this vision because it's indispensable to fulfilling the mission of the church, which is what we are called to go make disciples. We are communicating well as leaders when we are ready to move when God moves us forward. I'm almost finished, but in the days of the Exodus, when there were two and a half million, they said adults, men, and then you've got women and then you've got children. So we're at least seven and a half to ten million people roaming around the Exodus. You know the story. And God would show up as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by fire at, at night. A pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. And I can just imagine, I can just imagine the chaos when God showed up and told his people it's time to move forward. Can you imagine trying to move 5 to 10 million people that didn't have indoor plumbing? Just saying, that's messy. You've got to move whether you want to or not. It may not have even been spiritual. It was practical. But God shows up and said, it's time to move. And to move 5 to 8 to 10 million people all together. Can you imagine, if it was anything like my family, it would be I'm grabbing the tent poles. You're, you're grabbing the children. I'm grabbing the other child. Wait, that's not even my child. Who's got the goat? Who's got the donkey? That donkey just kicked one of our other children. It would be mad chaos in my house if we had to up and just go. But God had given a vision to his leaders and through the tribes and through the families. They began communicating that when God shows up, we're going to be ready to move. We've been praying for a move of God around here for decades, and God has moved in certain capacities, but I believe that I believe God's about to move in a way greater than we have ever seen him move before. But we've got to get ready so that when God shows up with a pillar of fire, we are ready to go, Pastor. The sign that we are communicating effectively and that we are united around this vision and that the source of our strength, the heartbeat that we have for this vision and for this community to receive the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and to experience him in repentance in water baptism, baptism and in filling of the Holy Ghost and living a new life. Well, we are witnessing that and we are ready for that to truly change the face of this community is that when God shows up, we're not praying for a move of God. We become a move of God. But we can't become a move of God until we are together in one mind and in one accord. And when God speaks, when he shows up, we are already ready to pack up and move forward toward his great vision. We've got to be ready to move with God. That is how you start a movement. We're not asking God to create a movement. We become a movement. When our heart is beating with his for the lost of this community. We are vessels of his spirit and we are stewards of his church. He has given us his vision and it is up to us to take steps forward to fulfilling it. Can we stand together? God, help us with our time, our talent, and our treasure. God, that you would be first in our lives. This vision for this church has been entrusted to our capable hands. And as we pray together tonight, would you lift your hands and would you open your heart? And would you ask God to purge anything from it? Would you ask God to wash your mind right now? Come on, from the front of the back to this place, before we dismiss, would you ask God to begin to fix the source? Lord, put faith inside of my heart. God, put, put hope inside of my heart. Allow my vision to be 
be baptized so that I can see your vision for your church, for my family, for my ministry, for my life. God, I don't need to know how. I just need to know what my next step of faith is. Lord, bring us together for such a time as this. As you are showing up with Holy Ghost and with fire, you have given us the vision to get this out of this church and into this city. Help us, Lord, to be together in one mind and one accord. Help us to be united. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every division amongst the brethren or the sisters be gone in Jesus' name. God, wash that out of this place. Bring us together. Allow us to trust one another. Allow us to lock our arms together and say, hey, I just care that we're together marching toward God's vision for his church. Somebody call upon the Lord right now. God, I can't neglect. I cannot neglect or take for granted the togetherness, the unity of the body. Lord, help us be healthy. Healthy things grow, Lord. Help us as a church be incredibly healthy by being together. I pray, God, you wash us. Baptize our minds. Give us the mind of Christ. Give us your vision. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Ask your neighbor, what are you communicating? Now I want you to ask him, what will you be communicating? Because pastor, the leaders, this campaign team, they will be speaking the vision over this church. But whether it lives or whether it dies depends on what you do with it when the future of the church is put in your hands. Speak life. Speak, speak hope. Speak with faith that is dangerous. Speak words you may not even totally believe yourself right now, but you have, you have this security that I am trusting in the Lord and leaning not upon my own understanding. I'm delighting in His ways, which may not be my ways, but Lord, have your way. Have your way, Lord. They're going to sing a chorus here, and I want you to just pray that right now. Lord, have your way. Have your way with my abilities. Have your way with my time. Have your way, Lord, in my family. Have your way in my marriage. Have your way in this church. God, we need you to have your way. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Lord, we need to be a move of Jesus. Help me be a move of the Lord. Help me be so filled with your spirit that it just pours out of me.
want you to clap your hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the victory is at hand, and we are triumphant in Jesus. I feel faith in the house. With God, all things are possible. I want you to turn to somebody right now before we're dismissed. I want you to look them in the eye. I want you to get some moxie in your spirit, some faith up in there. And when you speak this, I want you to believe it. I want you to see, we can do this together nothing will come between us because we are the body of Christ and Christ with us the hope of glory now clap your hands one more time and give him some praise this will be for your glory not ours for the uplifting of your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. There are so many folks that can only feel comfortable when they have the affirmation of people around them. But I tell you what I feel most comfortable about is being covered by the prayers of God's people. As your pastor, I feel that. Amen. I thank you for your support, your love. Thank you for your prayers, and it makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Uh, this Saturday evening at 7 o'clock, we, you know, we have prayer every Saturday. But this Saturday is a little different. We need everybody here. Well, Dan McLeod will be leading us in prayer Saturday night, and then he will be here preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, a life-changing weekend. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, life-changing weekend. If you don't want to miss it, it's going to be a great time. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Brother Mitchell, for a great message, a great word from the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look forward to seeing you Saturday evening.